Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Neil Edson. I'm the president of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. And I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, uh, which by the way, is, a, is part of a series of monthly webinars that are brought to you free. Uh, for those of you in Tennessee and beyond who are interested in your community trees or you're responsible for your community trees or you'd like to see more done to your community trees, we try to offer topics that are relevant to you and to help us grow our beautiful community trees in Tennessee. Uh, this series is brought to you by the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the Tennessee University of Tennessee Ur how can I get this right? Residential and Community Forestry Working Group. And you can see some of the logos of the university system that are part of that. So it's a team effort to bring these to you and uh, it's something that we enjoy doing. Uh, today's topic is gonna address emerald ash borer. And uh, we're gonna hear from Dr. Cameron Studdard in just a, a minute, but I do wanna, I guess, do a little housekeeping here. Uh, this program has been certified. I know I'm, I got out of sync there, Christy, with your slides, but if you could back up. Uh, it has qualified for International Society of Boricultural uh, Certified Arborist CEUs, one hour, uh, and we will take care of that for you as long as you stay on the program uh, throughout the duration here. We'll register that for you. We also qualify for one hour category three pesticide certification here in the state of Tennessee. And once again, uh, just stay on this program throughout the duration and we will handle that uh, submission for you. You won't have to do a thing. Uh, today's topic is on the emerald ash borer and that's a very relevant and uh, timely topic for us here in the state. Uh, I know where most of us, if not all of us are aware of this uh, threat to our native ash trees and we have with us someone who's going to get us up to date on that, the status of it, and also uh, what to expect. And hopefully he'll talk about some things we can do to mitigate that problem. So uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cameron Staudard, who is the Forest Health Program Specialist with the Tennessee Division of Forestry. And Cameron, I'm going to put you in the awkward position of further introducing yourself. <laughs> Uh, and as you begin your presentation. But let's, uh, let's listen to Dr. Stoddard as he gets us up to date on EAB. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'll just say thank you for the invitation to, to talk to you guys today. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to talk about an extremely relevant topic, um, that being Emerald Ash Borer. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am the Forest Health Program Specialist for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. I've only been here about 10 months. Um, prior to this, I've been in grad school. And so I have a, a BS in forestry from the University of Tennessee. After finishing that, I went up to West Virginia University where I um, pursued and received a, a master's and a PhD in forest pathology. Um, that said, I am a forest pathologist. Um, my background has largely focused on working with various plant diseases, so things like beech bark disease, chestnut blight, um, oak wilt, so diplodia canker, things like that. Uh, but occasionally I did dabble with a lot of insect fungus interactions as well. So I've worked on um, kind of the ambrosia beetles, symbioses and things like that. So um, since stepping into this position, it's been interesting because a lot of our problems here in Tennessee are insect pest problems. It's not to say we don't have plant diseases out there that are causing significant damage. Things like lower wilt are very present in the state and they're moving about killing off tree species such as sassafras and spice bush. Um, but you know what we find is that there are um, a number of more pressing matters and those being our insect pests. So things like emerald ash borer and gypsy moth. Um, and those are really in, in hemlock really adelgin and issues like that um, that are having significant effects on our forest. So my role is basically uh, managing those programs. So I help to coordinate forest health detection um, programs such as the gypsy moth traps that are implemented across the state. Um, and then, you know, tracking down lower wilt in new, in new counties for that and um, hemlock really adelgin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
But yeah, I, am, I, I guess I can go ahead and share my screen and get over into my presentation for today. Yes, um, I'm going to stop sharing and okay. you should have control of the screen now. And I just want to remind or tell anyone who's here who did not register, please go to the chat and use that link that I dropped into the chat to register to make sure you get credit. Thank you. Okay, let's see here. All right, are you seeing my screen? Okay. All right, awesome. Okay, so yes, yeah, Emerald Ash Borer, that is today's topic, and we're going to talk about what to expect and how to respond. And so one of the things I like to do whenever I'm addressing forced health issues is really to take a step back and talk about kind of more broad concepts to contextualize the issue that we're dealing with. Um, so to begin, I thought it'd be a, a good opportunity to review uh, some basic concepts and really talk about those. So um, why don't we start with just what is an invasive species? And so a formal definition of that could be a non-native or exotic species that's capable of doing a few things. Um, first of all, it's gonna to have to establish, but then it's going to invade. And because of that invasion, it disrupts that new ecosystem. So to break that down even further, uh, establishment is pretty straightforward. Um, basically that means that the organism, and we'll, we'll keep it in the context of plants because plants are easiest to really discuss in this matter. So say you have a plant species, and establishment means that basically it can grow under the natural conditions of the area. So behind the text here, you can see kudzu. You can see it's growing great under those conditions. It doesn't have any issues with um, the climate of the area, the moisture availability, um, the competitive species in the area, any pest or pathogens that might be specific. Unfortunately, we don't have a good pest or pathogen for kudzu. Um, at this point in time, but hopefully one day we'll, we'll have one that pops up and really starts to control those populations. But it's not necessarily an issue if it establishes. Um, we have many plant species we plant in our yard that aren't native to here. Um, so they're not native or exotic species, but they, they, and while they are able to establish, they don't take the next steps that really make it into a problem. And so with invasive species, we start to consider them an issue when they start to invade. So again, referring back to the kudzu, you can see that kudzu is a great invader. It's able to grow over trees. It's able to take down the school bus that's in the photo behind here. Um, and it's unimpeded by the um, competitive, uh, like any competitors that might be in the area. So all of our native plants, at least on the site conditions where kudzu becomes a problem are unable to compete. And so, for that reason, the invasive qualities of kudzu um, and its ability to really grow under those conditions is great. Um, but the issue is, is that it starts to disrupt that ecosystem. So you have to consider that this is a vine that is covering up other plants in the area. When it covers it up, it blocks the light and thus shades out anything underneath it and effectively smothering it or killing it. Um, by blocking that light. And so when you have these invasive species and they're invasive in nature and they're dis and they, you know, are causing some effect on other, you know, flora fauna in the area, we consider that to be a disruption to that ecosystem to which they've been introduced. It's also worth noting that not all non-native species are invasive. I think we pretty much all know this, but it's something to keep in mind that we have a lot of non-natives that are planted that don't become problems. There are many species capable of growing here, but not all of them are going to become issues. That said, we do intentionally introduce some, um, or we have in the past introduced some plant species and um, insects and things that while there was no intent on it being a problem, it became a problem um, so take something like Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven was brought into a garden preacher in Philadelphia um, and it escaped and it became a problem. Same thing with Gypsy Moth. It was brought over, um, it escaped and became a problem. Um, and then things that are, you know, maybe not necessarily um, as, have as much attention on them, things like calorie pear or um, golden rain tree seems to be another one that may become an invasive issue. Um, but that said, there are passive introductions as well. We have these active ones where we intentionally bring stuff in, but we also unintentionally bring things in, such as emerald ash borer, which would have come in on infested wood products from Asia. So once it gets here, it gets out into the environment and becomes an issue. It's also worth noting that native species can exhibit invasive-like characteristics under the right conditions. 
Now this is gonna be more subjective in nature. Say you have a field and you want that field to stay a field. Um, you have pioneer species, species that, tree species that grow into disturbed areas first and they are fast growing. They typically have light seeds and um, they're kind of established the forest in other words. This is technically an invasive like characteristic. Um, and if you, sub, if, if you want your field to stay a field and it's trying to become a forest, technically that's kind of in the same line as these invasive species. Um, and it's just interesting to think of things like that. We don't consider it necessarily to be a problem until we put our subjective, um, um, I guess our objectives onto the situation. And then we consider some things that are even native species to be rather invasive in that way. So how common are these successful invaders? Um, and I think it's first good to kind of contextualize it a little bit more. And so we can use this disease triangle. This is something we use in plant pathology, that kind of diagram is what you need in order for a disease to occur. I like to adapt this for other purposes. So you can have disease here, but you can also have an infestation. So it works well for pests and pathogens. So you have, you know, in the lower left-hand corner, you have the unchecked pest or pathogen. So unchecked being that it, you know, grows at a rapid rate, it doesn't really have any natural, natural predators that could really regulate that population. Um, but then you also have it interacting with what we'll call a naive host. A naive host is basically a host that doesn't have um, the, the adaptations to defend themselves from becoming infested or infected by that pest or pathogen. They didn't co-evolve together and therefore, you know, the host doesn't, doesn't know how to recognize or defend itself to, any, to that new introduced threat. Um, and then in the lower right-hand corner, you have a favorable environment. That's another factor that we have to consider. If you don't have a favorable environment, it breaks the potential for disease or infestation down. Um, but if, you know, or if you, and obviously if you take out the other two, they wouldn't occur either. If you don't have a host, obviously you don't have disease or infestation, same thing with pest or pathogen. But given that you have these multiple factors that are interacting, it makes it to where the odds of something becoming a pest are fairly low. And there's this quote over here that basically says, globally, an average of 10% of introduced organisms may establish, so they may be able to grow in a new location, while only about 1% become pests. Um, take this with a huge grain of salt. This is going to vary significantly by location. It's going to vary on what organism you're talking about. Um, but it really just goes to say that, you know, there, there aren't many organisms that, are, that will be introduced to a new area that will become a pest. But the ones that do become pests typically are really, really problematic. And that's why we're here today to talk about number ash borer because it's one of those very few that was introduced and has truly caused significant damage to ash populations and their respective ecosystems um, across the landscape. So what types of organisms can be invasive species? Really just about anything. Obviously bacteria, um, we consider this, you know, less so with plants, but you know, with human health, we can have invasive bacteria. Fungi, especially with plants are uh, kind of where most of the plant diseases fall. Um, we have invasive plant pathogens out there that are fungi. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. So of course, viruses can be invasive species as well. Um, insects, that's why we're here today. You know, we have anim or, you know, animal examples as well, things like the feral hog. And then of course, um, invasive plants can be invasive species too. But I like to think of it, take, a, take, it completely, take a completely objective um, view on this and think about, are we an invasive species too? And I find this to, you know, this may, this is more of a philosophical question. It's going to, you know, break down into, you know, what we feel our ownership of the land is and et cetera, et cetera. But if we take a purely objective standpoint, we are very much an invasive species. If you take that formal de definition of invasive species, something that can establish somewhere, so we're thriving in a location, we're invading into new territories on that location, and we disrupt ecosystems. And I think it's good to recognize ourselves as this. Um, it's not to shame us or anything like that, but rather just to make us aware of our impact on the landscape. Um, we disrupt our ecosystems by resource extraction, leading to things such as acid mine drainage. We break up forests through forest fragmentation. Um, we, you know, our emissions and things have caused issues with acid, um, acid rain in the past, although it's not much of an issue anymore. Um, oil spills, climate change, um, 
really plastic pollution, whatever, you name it, we, we have a lot, we have a huge impact on our ecosystems and our environment as a whole. And we have to recognize that, you know, while we may be talking about Ember Nash Borer today, um, we have a much broader impact on our ecosystems than pretty much any of these insect pests do. It's just alarming when we see something else come in and really cause damage to very specific tree species, such as emerald ash borer and our ash species, or hemlock woody belgian hemlocks. And um, fortunately, we can be reactive and try to come up with management schemes and uh, plans to really try to mitigate the effects of these invasive pests. But um, I think we just need to be mindful of our own actions as well because we are responsible for moving these pests here as well. I mean, we introduced emerald ash borer, we introduced gypsy moth, we introduced chestnut blight. So a lot of these huge scars on the landscape that are persistent problems in our forest are due to us moving these organisms around. And we should be mindful of that. So today we're gonna to talk about the emerald ash borer, the star of the hour. Um, a couple of photos here. So you can see on the upper left-hand corner, you can see the adult um, beetle and alongside its larval state. And so you can see the larva is quite long and large, and then you have a nice, beautiful emerald ash borer beetle. And it is quite, quite a nice, I mean, it's a very um, a pretty beetle, and it has a nice uh, emerald color. It's nice and shiny. It's easy to see whenever you do see it flying around. They're pretty, they catch your eye. Um, but then over in the um, center, you see the galleries that it calls, and you see these are what we call serpentine galleries, and we'll see some other images of these in a minute. Um, but then you can see the larva inside of one of those galleries crawling through, and that's more or less what is causing those tunnels under the bark. But to talk about the ash species as a whole, if you're unfamiliar with ash species, um, here are some example photos. You can see in the left-hand um, photo, the rope-like bark, um, kind of a braided rope-like appearance. Here are the seeds in the middle of the ash trees. These are samaras, um, similar to your maple seeds, but they don't come off in pairs. They instead are singletons. And you have the compound leaf over on the right. And the compound leaf can be confused with things like hickory and uh, maybe tree of heaven, um, sumacs and things like that, because you do end up with some variation in you know, the morphology of those leaf shapes um, as you go across the species. But as a whole, we have 16 ash species adapted to various climate zones, soil types, and moisture gradients in the US. And so given that they're adapted to these different conditions, that means that they're falling into different forest types. As we expand um, the impact of EAB into different forest types, we're affecting you know, varying um, um, ecosystems ultimately because of that. And so as you fragment things out and you consider that ember ash borer is impacting multiple different forest types, you can really get a good sense of how significant of an impact ember ash borer is having on the landscape. Um, so we find out of those 16, the black, white, and green ash are most common and widespread, um, but you do have things like pumpkin ash and Carolina ash and um, blue ash as well. And emerald ash borer is just another introduced pest. It just happens to be a very significant and um, present one at the moment. But we have other examples that have historic examples as well as um, you know, ones that maybe haven't made it here to Tennessee yet or even to the US yet that will become problems in the future. This one in particular, emerald ash borer was introduced from Asia to North America. It was introduced on infested wood products over to Detroit, Michigan. They first detected it in 2002 but that said, it was actually um, here for approximately 10 years prior to that. So we've had an emerald ash borer here in the US for almost 30 years now, um, depending on the approximation of when it actually was introduced. It's been detected since then in 35 US states and across five Canadian provinces. And so the spread of emerald ash borer is quite, um, quite impressive to say the least. We have other examples of widespread mortality caused by other organisms that have been here um, for a much longer time, but you know, the classic example of a uh, chestnut blight in American chestnut, it took about 60 years for it to get, or 50 or 60 years to get from Maine down to Georgia along the Appalachian Mountains. But what we've seen with emerald ash borer is it's actually moved at a more rapid rate and has spread even further in that time frame than um, you know, what we consider to be one of the most devastating forest health issues of the past. 
And so this is considered to be the most destructive and costly wood boring insect to invade the U.S. So I pulled some numbers from a publication I found. And so there's citations there if you wanted to look that up. But as far as the forest value, we have to consider that there are about, there are greater than, or more than 7.55 billion timber sized ash trees with a value of over $282 billion. That's just your forest value. And the urban value, these are going to be, you know, your street trees, your park trees, your yard trees, et cetera. You know, it's between 20 and $60 billion um, of value there. And so interestingly enough, you take that, you know, you combine it. So you have what, um, possibly $342 billion in value that could be lost if all those ash trees were to die. So because of that, because it's a destructive nature and because there is that value that can be lost, it's already a very significant pest. But then you start to think about things like, oh, well, what about treatments and removal and replacement costs? And so if you, one study looked at, you know, estimating these costs for only 25 U.S. communities. So 25 U.S. communities over one decade. And it estimated that, you know, over that time, those costs would, you know, accumulate to about $25 billion. And if I'm not mistaken, this is kind of like looking at it from a one-shot perspective, you know, if you were to take care of it all in one time. Um, but even still, you know, $25 billion for 25 U.S. communities. And that's a cost associated with the loss that you're already incurring by those ash trees dying. Um, so you can see that emerald ash borer is a significant pest from an economic sense and of course from an ecological sense as well. And we we're talking before we got started um, today about differential ash susceptibility. Um, and I think this is a very interesting topic because I think that there's opportunity for you know, a lot of research to be done here, but you can imagine that this is difficult. Um, you're trying to test ash susceptibility to an insect pest. You're trying to do so um, out under natural conditions with, you know, trying to keep an eye, keep an idea of like, you know, um, you know, whether or not you're introducing the emerald ash borer to those trees, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of parameters that make it a very complicated thing to do. And plus you have 16 species to compare if you really want to have a comparative analysis. So it's pretty complicated, but what has been shown is that emerald ash borer prefers white and black ash. Um, and so interestingly enough, you know, this preference, it may not be due to some resistance in the other species, but it may. Um, and those are things that need to be further determined in the future. But one thing to consider is that, you know, you have an insect that has a preference for where it lays its eggs and where it lays its eggs is going to determine whether or not um, that tree becomes infested. Because as we talked about with the life cycle here in a minute, the way that it works is that the eggs are laid on the bark, the eggs hatch and the larva goes inside the tree. So if you have some preference among your uh, or if, if the emerald ash borer has a preference as to where it's going to lay its eggs, obviously you're going to see some differential um, effects on your ash species as a whole. But it makes you really wonder, are the other hosts that aren't necessarily preferred just going to simply be um, all, uh, like intermediate hosts, like secondary hosts that are attacked based on preferred host availability? So as you lose all your white and black ash, does it move over to some of the less preferred ash? And, and are those equally susceptible to it? And um, I know that studies are being done on this and I imagine there's some actual um, good data out there to, you know, truly say whether or not you do have some like some slight resistance, but even still what we see, even the ones that, you know, are considered to be maybe less preferred, they're still susceptible and they still are killed by emerald ash borer. It's just that they don't seem to be um, attacked as frequently as what we see with some of the other species. That's the reason I think it's a preference issue. Um, but because we have so many ash species, you know, and, they, and it is such a devastating pest, there have been six ash species that have been listed as critically endangered. They have white ash, Carolina ash, black ash, um, uh, green ash, pumpkin ash, and blue ash. And I imagine that as emerald ash borer spreads throughout and more into the range of some of the other ash species, they will be listed as well. Um, but yes, the um, there does seem to be some difference among these species, whether or not it's going to be a useful difference uh, for things like breeding programs to try to lead to some resistance is pretty questionable at this point. Um, but there, it is something worth exploring more and it'll be interesting to see what comes out in the future in the literature. So we could talk about the life cycle of emerald ash borer a little bit. Um, like I said, the female ash borer is going to lay eggs on the outside of the bark. 
those eggs will hatch. The larva would then go through the bark and get into basically right under the bark. This diagram set shows the larvae going a little bit deeper than they actually would. Um, we'll see the layers that are actually affected in a minute, but typically it just goes right under the bark and starts to burrow uh, circumferentially around the tree. Um, so for about one to two years, the larvae are in there and eventually they'll pupate into adults. Um, I know that that says an actual size over there on the right. That's not, I mean, it's going to depend on your screen size ultimately, but um, you know, my screen that's much larger than in the normal um, emerald ash borer. So take that with a grain of salt as well. But as they do mature into adults, they're going to chew this telltale D-shaped exit hole in the bark. And this D-shaped exit hole is something you can use as a diagnostic. You know, whenever you're going out, you think your tree has emerald ash borer. If you're able to see um, a point at which the tree has been killed off, some of the dieback, and you see those D-shaped exit holes, you can feel pretty confident that you do have emerald ash borer. Now, whenever they do emerge, they'll fly around, they'll mate, um, they'll eat on the leaves a little bit, and that'll be important later when we talk about pesticides. Um, and then the females, again, will lay eggs and then the cycle repeats. So how exactly does emerald ash borer damage its host? So like I said, it's going under the bark and it's really focusing its feeding on the phloem and cambium. So the two bottom, um, the two bottom pieces here. And so the phloem being the uh, transductive tissue that transports sugars and growth hormones and other nutrients. The cambium is the layer of tissue that is kind of a reproductive layer. It gives rise to new phloem and new cambium every year. Um, and then sapwood or xylem is what's tr transporting most of the water and minerals from between the roots and the crown. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, what we find is that the EEB, although they're feeding mainly on these two tissues, the phloem and cambium, they are damaging the sapwood as well. And so as the larva grows, it, it gr outgrows this, this layer and basically starts to dig into the xylem as well. And that damage to the xylem is what ultimately cuts off the flow of water between the roots and the crown and leads to a lot of the dieback you will see. And in addition to that, given that you are, you are destroying this uh, reproductive layer that gives rise to the new xylem, you know, if you damage this circumferentially around the tree, it ultimately girdles it. So it cuts off the flow of nutrients and water between the roots and the crown and kills it from that point up. And at that point, you'll, we'll see some photos later where the tree will begin to send out epicormic shoots as it's trying to rebuild a crown. And it does so, and it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, I don't know what word you would use for it, but it's pretty uh, dramatic how many shoots the trees will start to put out. And it starts to look more like a bush than anything. Um, but let's talk about signs and symptoms of a, uh, emerald ash borer infestation. So these are things to look for whenever you're out looking at your ash trees, especially if you're if you don't think uh, emerald ash borer is in your area yet. You know, keep an eye on the crown of your trees. If you start to see, you know, dead branches in the crown, um, you can you can kind of suspect that something's going on. Unfortunately, emerald ash borer does attack the crown first, and so it makes it a little bit difficult to. Um, diagnose at that point unless you can get up into the crown. So, you know, you can't just go down here to the where you could actually reach the trunk of the tree and chisel away and see whether or not you have larvae because basically all the damage is going to be up here and all the larvae will be up there whenever they first begin infesting the tree. Um, and so that usually keeps us a little bit behind on detection. Um, we use traps to detect um, because, you know, doing it in the field becomes complicated because of the way that EB attacks the tree. And so, you know, if it takes, you know, some time before the, you know, the brand, before the, you know, the entire tree is infested and we have larvae down here, you can imagine that, you know, that length of time is how far behind we are in actually detecting unless we are able to catch one in a trap. But other signs to look out for, like we've seen in the last one, crown dieback of this is really characteristic. Um, typically you start to see some epicormic sprouts down lower in the crown. Um, if it gets really far along and the infestation starts to get into the trunk at that point, you'll start to see this kind of bush shaped form where epicormic sprouts really start to um, be pushed out of the area that is still living on the tree. So this is what I was saying, it's kind of dramatic just because it's producing so many sprouts. Um, and then if you were to you know, chip away the bark, you can kind of see it in this photo, there's some um, uh, serpentine galleries right under the bark from the EB larvae. 
Woodpecker damage was another telltale sign. Uh, woodpeckers love to try to get under the bark and get the larvae because there's so many present. So it's an easy, nice food source for it. And so, you know, woodpeckers will go to town on, on an infected or an infested ash tree. And so you tend to see this kind of white, tannish or orangish um, coloration where the bark has been removed. And then as you kind of look around, you might find some exit holes or even just some other holes where the, where the woodpeckers been feeding. Again, the D-safe exit holes, this is really diagnostic, um, something to look for, especially if you can reach some branches. And then under the bark, you'll find the serpentine galleries. And you see that they are not as uniform as what we may see with some other wood-boring insects, which have a kind of a distinctive pattern. Instead, it's just serpentine and kind of random. And you can see that they're quite wide too. I mean, the larva is not, not the smallest larvae out there, that's for sure. And it can really cause significant damage under the bark. And because of the size, you have to think that this is, you know, this is a, a tube that's being formed. And so the depth into the tree is, is um, significant as well. And that's ultimately why the xylem gets damaged is because of how round and thick the, um, the uh, insect larvae are whenever they get to be fairly mature. So looking at an ash tree, um, something we can consider, we can consider there's a healthy ash tree on the left and it looks perfectly fine, but if you start to see your ash tree look like the right and you see significant crown die back, you know, epicorn shoots in the crown, if you were to cut one of those dead branches off and find galleries, you know, all of these serve as diagnostic tools to help you determine whether or not you do have an ash borer infestation. So where is EUB in the US? So this is a map from January 4th, 2021. So it's the most up-to-date map. And all the yellow counties are counties that have been confirmed for EAB. And so you can see, we'll look at Tennessee more closely in a minute. But one thing I wanted to point out is the significance of these um, infestations that are kind of outside of the main area. So you have Colorado, some in Nebraska, South Dakota maybe fits into that, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama. So um, interestingly, these, these introductions outside of this main area, especially surrounding Michigan, you know, are likely mediated from the movement of infested wood products. And so especially when you get out to Colorado, it probably was a camper who brought, who was camping out here at one point, picked up some, un, some untreated ash firewood and went over to camp in Colorado. And all of a sudden, you know, the beetles emerge and they fly out and they begin infecting ash trees in Colorado. And so, you know, we have to consider that this is a huge mode of transport for emerald ash borer, the movement of infested wood products. And that's why you see a lot of campaigns, we'll talk about them in a minute, but a lot of campaigns and outreach that basically are saying, you know, don't move firewood. And a lot of it's because these wood boring insects are, are really easily transported in, in untreated firewood. And so they end up being introduced to new areas. If we're gonna look at Tennessee a little bit more closely. Um, this, is, this is basically the map from last year. Um, I, these counties should be filled in, but um, these were the new counties. I want to keep the stars there because it's really just the counties that were confirmed in 2020, um, those being Dixon and Hickman. Um, but all the green counties are currently within the Tennessee uh, stated uh, quarantine. So basically, any ash materials from the green cannot go into the white. So um, as to limit the spread of inward ash borer. And um, Odds are, again, I kind of alluded to this a little bit, odds are the infestation is a little bit further um, west than what we were indicating here. This is, just, this is just what we have actually confirmed at this point in time. Um, and, you know, I've, driv I've kind of driven around through some of these counties looking for uh, declining ash, and they're there, but again, I don't have a bucket truck, and I'm not able to get it to the crown, so they're frustrated because I couldn't really confirm that it was there without actually getting the specimen and showing that these ash trees were, in fact, infested. So, you know, how far west it is is questionable, but it really depends on landowners, um, you know, and other uh, members of different agencies and such actually reaching out whenever they do see declining ash and letting someone know. Um, I found since being here in just a month, short 10 months that, you know, a lot of, a lot of my um, forest health monitoring efforts are aided by landowners calling me and saying, hey, like, you know, I think I have 
Um, so I'm coming off what Adele John, my hemlocks are up in my ash are infected. And so um, really it's just about trying to decrease, you know, plant blindness and have people look up a little bit at their trees occasionally and we we'll probably get a better handle on where exactly emerald ash borer is in the state. So let's talk about management. So this is kind of getting into the how you should respond section, but we want to talk about these management strategies first. And so with pest management, we're going to come back to this disease triangle or infestation triangle. You could replace disease if you wanted to. And think about the three components and realize that all of these, each of these three components has variables we can manipulate. So there are key factors we can manipulate in an attempt to regulate or control a pest. So say we focused on the pest or pathogen. You know, one of the obvious things is, is to use pesticides. Another idea would be to use uh, biological control. Now biological control development could take a long time. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but if you were to, able to achieve, be able to achieve an effective biocontrol, it makes it a more natural passive management strategy rather than actively going out and using pesticides. Putting pesticides out in the environment is not, a, is not the best thing in the world. We don't wanna do it, but in the case of you know, protecting you know, whole tree species or multiple tree species, sometimes we have to. Traps will work for some things. Um, take gypsy moth, for example. If, you, if we find, like, if we found that we detected a gypsy moth out in West Tennessee, where, uh, which is pretty far removed from the front of gypsy moth, odds are we could put a bunch of traps in the area and hopefully catch almost all of them. And so if we can catch them all and limit the population from growing, you know, that's, that's great. And it's a very easy um, method of actually controlling the population, but it doesn't work for a lot of things. It only works for a few. Removal, removal is complicated too. Um, you know, removing material and destroying it, you know, may work under certain conditions, but oftentimes, uh, at least on a forest scale, it becomes difficult, if not impossible. Um, the other aspect to consider is we could look at the host. Um, can we develop a resistant variety of the host? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. But again, just like biopatrol, it takes a long time to develop these resistant varieties. I mean, they've been working on American chestnut for how many years now? I mean, it's been going on for 60, 70 years, I think, at this point. And the breeding program started, I'm pretty sure, in the 60s. Um, and, you know, they just now use transgenic to actually get to the point, transgenics to get to the point where they've developed a resistant chestnut that is more resistant than even Chinese chestnut, which is considered to be the most resistant among the species. Um, but then you have to deal with the regulations of, uh, you know, genetically modified organisms and get, you know, that approved to be able to be released on the landscape. So they've been going through a huge process up in uh, SUNY um, in Syracuse, New York to, get the resistant transgenic chestnut out and available. Uh, but even still, just to further complicate things, you have to consider that you then have to restore a species back to its natural state. So trying to introduce American chestnut or resistant American chestnut um, between Maine and Georgia is a very complicated and long process. Um, so it's kind of like a long-term view at that point. Um, we'd rather be reactive and be able to, or proactive even, and be able to use some of these other methods to control the pest. But when you start to, you know, consider restoration and resistance and things like that, it becomes a much longer long-term process. But one that definitely has to be pursued long-term. Um, exclusion, that's, you know, you can't really exclude trees in the forest or on the landscape. Um, you're not going to put a big net over your tree. I mean, I guess you could if it's a smaller tree, but if it's a, you know, full-size mature yard tree, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Some things can be regulated by host vigor, maintaining healthy trees, but those are mostly the ones that are pests that are targeting, um, you know, weakened trees. And so you try to keep your trees healthy, keep some of those, and those are typically native pests too, native pests and pathogens that will target those weaker trees. And that's where we come in, it would become an issue. But environment on a landscape scale, on a forest scale, on a yard scale, that's going to be difficult as well. Now, I'm sure you could irrigate your trees if that's going to have an effect, but um, enclosures and things like that are going to be difficult. So really it leaves you with resistant varieties and looking at the pest or pathogen and trying to regulate that way. 
But when we put it on a forest scale, which that's the way I see things because, you know, we are division, I'm in the division of forestry and, you know, my expertise is basically looking at forest health issues as a whole. Not to say that they don't become tree health issues in urban landscapes, but, you know, we have to think about multifaceted approaches because we have to think about how to apply these pest management strategies in a practical way on a large scale. So you start to try to build out integrated pest management um, strategies that um, you know, employ multiple factors such as using pesticides, which again is a lot easier on an urban landscape than it is in the forest. And we'll talk about that with Emerald Ash Borer shortly. Or biocontrol, which you know, kind of leans on the forest side more so than the urban side. Um, maintaining forest diversity or you know, you bringing resistant varieties for restoration purposes is kind of a long-term strategy for integrated pest management as well. But in addition to all of these on the ground actions, we have to consider the importance of regulations and outreach as well. I consider outreach to be an invaluable tool for slowing the spread of invasive species. You know, uh, conversations like we're having today, um, putting some information out there, bringing some awareness to the issues that are affecting, you know, our landscape is very important. And there's a lot of a lot of programs out there, like the Don't Move Firewood campaign, that you know seeks to help inform people that moving firewood can really be an issue unless it's treated um, firewood. And so, um, you know, education, outreach, all these things are extremely important and extremely um, uh, beneficial in the long term because you know anybody who I get to and you know. I guess educate on emerald ash borer will go out and maybe look at their hash trees and maybe they'll let me know something. And so I see this as an invaluable tool. Regulations, you know, regulations are done. Um, like I said, Tennessee still has the, um, the quarantine on ash um, wood products being moved between the quarantine area and the non-quarantine area. Um, and, you know, before, before this year, um, the federal uh, I guess APHIS, for example, and Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, um, they um, had a federal quarantine that was restricting the movement of ash wood products, but they recently dropped it. This was pretty interesting, and it was the, you know, ultimately likely the right choice, but what they found is that the regulatory efforts they were making were not proving to be worth the cost. They weren't as effective um, as the, you know, as they thought they needed to be based on the money that they were putting into it. And instead, they decided to take those funds and put it towards research efforts, looking for resistance and developing resistant ash um, varieties of the, you know, the 16 species, which is a huge project. Um, or, you know, from the sake of biocontrol, really dumping more money to biocontrol and expanding that research effort, which is really the way to go because emerald ash borer is having its way, whether or not regulating it or not. Um, so we need to start thinking about the kind of long-term strategies here. So how to respond? So response is going to be different based on who you are. Um, are you just a landowner who has a yard and has mass trees in it? Are you a forest landowner? Do you have a large property that you manage for timber? Do you manage it for recreation? Um, and, you know, this is where things get a little bit nuanced. And this is a whole conversation in itself. But I thought I could put together just a, a few good thoughts about how you should respond regardless of what's going on. First of all, you gotta be proactive. Being proactive with emerald ash borer is key. Reactive measures are usually too late. If you see 30% of your crown has died back, odds are you're not gonna save that tree by treating with um, insecticides at that point in time. Um, and that's mostly due to the damage that has already been done to the tree. Um, because emerald ash borer damages the tree in the way it does, it's damaging the transductive tissues. Um, if it can no longer move the pesticide throughout the tree because of how much damage has been done, you're not gonna be able to fully protect the tree. So you have to treat your trees proactively, but you don't wanna just you know, put pesticides out in the environment just because either. So it becomes this kind of um, difficult fine line to really define. And one kind of general rule of thumb, and I think I'll say this again later, but if Emerald Ash Borer is 30 miles away from your property, if it's been confirmed in the county over, for example, it's probably time to go ahead and treat your trees. Um, and you can, you know, you're going to likely need to hire a, a, a licensed professional to do this anyway, and they can, you know, give you a good assessment of, you know, is your tree already infested? How infested is it? Um, and is it, you know, time to treat or not based on what they've been doing in the area? 
Now, these decisions also need to be based on your management objectives. So this is especially true for, you know, forest land owners, but we can take it from, you know, someone who's just, you know, has a, has a house and has some ash trees around it. Um, if, you, if you do have a house and you have ash trees around and your ash trees are not dead yet, um, you know, it might, might be one of those things that you are encouraged to spend the money to treat those trees because you are going to end up, you know, having the risk of that tree being killed and falling in your home. You're going to have the property value loss when those trees do die. Um, if they shade your house significantly, you can imagine that your, um, your electric bill is going to go up in the summer. Um, and so if you factor in all these costs, associated with the loss of those tree species or the, you know, the removal of them if they do die, you know, you can start to really justify spending the money on the treatments at that point. And so at that point, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, when we talk about management objectives, you know, it makes sense from the landowner perspective, especially at least from the, the common, you know, just yard trees and things like that. Um, to go ahead and start treating based on where and when ash borers in the state. Now it gets even more nuanced whenever you start talking about forest land owners because everyone manages their different for their property for different things. If you are so, say you manage it for timber value, and say you have you know less than twenty percent of your um, you know the trees on your property are ash trees, um, and they're kind of diffuse and they're spread out across the across your property. Um, it may not be that necessary for you to do anything, really, um, because if those trees were to die, they're going to create gaps and other trees are going to grow into those gaps. Uh, gaps. And another thing to say is that if you don't have a lot of value in your ash and you're not worried about losing that value, then you may not need to do anything. You might just let emerald ash borer go through your property and maybe cut down the trees that are in you, like some of your use, used areas if you have trails on your property or something and just let, let it take its course. But say you have, you know, greater than 20%, say like 25, 30, whatever percent, and you have this significant amount of ash and there's a significant amount of value tied up in that ash. That's when you want to start thinking about how you're, about your forest management plan. And so at this point, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, if, if you, you know, like to recruit professional help, it's one of those things that you might want to contact your area forester and help them to help have them help you develop a forest management plan that incorporates a responsive or proactive action against, um, you know, ash mortality from a ash borer. Um, but in all cases, regardless of what you do, compare the management costs with the potential value loss or risk. And, you know, also if you have a forest, go and assess and monitor any actions that are taken after the fact. Um, or, and make sure that you don't have like invasive species, you know, plant species really taking advantage of those gaps and really just be mindful of what's going on in your forest when you're out there. So now we can talk about chemical treatments. Um, you know, with pesticide applications, uh, tree ejections have been determined to be most effective um, depending on what chemical they're using. Um, these are typically used to protect urban trees. Um, you're probably not going to be doing a lot of pesticide applications in the forest, but if you had the money and you so wanted to, I guess you could. Um, but, you know, chemical treatment should be considered when risk or cost outweighs the cost of treatment. Um, you know, if your tree's small and you just want to cut it down, maybe you should just cut it down. But otherwise, you might want to protect that tree using pesticide applications. Now, most of these insecticide treatments need to be professionally administered, so you're going to probably have to hire someone. Um, and really, again, consider treating your ash trees if, you know, EAB is within 30 miles of your property. Now, your treatment intervals are going to vary based on what is actually applied. And so, you know, some pesticide considerations, there are a number of them out there. You have um, benzoate, which is kind of the best option for EAB control. Um, this, this is... Um, applied using a trunk injection method. There are two periods of the year that you can do the application and it provides protection for up to three years. So given that's a trunk injection, it can be a little bit more costly because of the equipment used for that versus something like a metacloprid, which can be done with a soil drench. Um, but really because it provides up to three years and because of the way that it affects the EAB, which we'll talk about here in a second, it's really kind of a preferred method for EAB control. Um, that said, an alternative would be Dometepron down at the bottom. This can be applied using a basal trunk spray. So you spray the tree along the, um, around the trunk and it, basically the tree uptakes the chemical 
and it gets incorporated and it, apply, and it allows some, um, some level of uh, protection for that tree. So effective control with an easy application method would be down to Tefron or Safari as the product name or one of the product names. And then as far as a truly effective up to three years of protection and Mimectin Benzoate is, is one of the better options. So I said, you know, it's really important about how it affects the trees as well, or affects the E to B rather. Um, so life stages for um, something like Mimectin Benzoate, you know, it's affecting up to four, I guess the four life stages of the larval stage. But then even as adult, after it emerges, if the adults will feed on the ash leaves and one to two bites of an ash leaf that has been treated with this chemical is uh, toxic to the adult. So that's great as well. Down to Tepperon, um, it only affects the first two life stages apparently, but you know, a few bites of the leaves is toxic to it as well. And aminoclopride is just not as effective, although it is used for other, other pests. Um, you know, it can allow for sustained feeding and Again, it's another, it's only a year of protection similar to Dimetephron, but Dimetephron just has some advantages based on this application method. And then it's a toxicity to the adults whenever they're feeding on the leaves. Okay, um, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, I just wanted to briefly talk about biocontrol because I feel that biocontrol of EB is the future and it's really the goal because this is a passive form of management for Hamlet ash borer. Um, and so here, you know, biocontrol development is a long, complicated process. I don't think that you could state this enough. You're having to find a, a potential biocontrol. You're having to vet it to make sure that it doesn't affect other species that would occur in the area. Typically, you're going to the native range of your pest. You're collecting uh, parasitoids or insects that will parasitize your pest. From there, bringing it here, making sure that they are selective strictly for EAB and releasing it. Um, and so here we have several species of EAB parasites that have been selected and they've shown promise. Both of these are, I mean, three of these are larval parasites and then the egg parasite, I think it's the Ubius uh, of real life. Um, and so each of these are going to basically lay eggs within the individual eggs of the larva and they basically eggs hatch and they feed on the larva after they hatch, which is, it's really gross kind of, but it works. Um, now, these are not typically available to, you know, just a landowner. They are typically, because they cost a lot to rear, um, they typically are released in selected locations that maximize success potential and impact. And so if we were to look at this map, what we find is that you see that the introductions are in red, the yellow are other infested areas that there have not been parasitoids released in, but the parasitoids are selected um, the release locations are selected and they're kind of spread out. And the idea here is that if you select, you know, prime locations for introducing these, um, that parasitoids will naturally spread from those locations and become and begin to cause um, or have some level of effect on EAB populations outside of where they are introduced. So what is the future of ash? This is kind of the last slide and I just want to leave with a couple of thoughts. On a landscape scale, EEB is likely here to stay, um, but effective control may be achievable. So, you know, control is not eradication. Um, you know, it'd be nice if we could completely eradicate EEB, but that's not likely going to be the case. Even with an effective biocontrol, the populations are just going to wax and wane. So, I mean, or ebb and flow rather. Um, and so you'll have EEB uh, populations um, at a very high level, parasitoids will, you know, kill off a significant part of that population with the lack of a large um, emerald ash borer population, the parasitoid populations will then fall. And so it's just going to go back and forth in that way. Um, resistant ash may be achievable, but as we talked about it, it's a, the growth restoration after developing, going through the process of developing resistant ash is a long and challenging one. Um, also considering the fact that there are 16 ash species that resistant varieties would need to be developed for. Um, I mean, the obvious, the obvious choice is to do so with transgenic once they, transgenics once they identify a means of providing resistance to the ash trees, but making sure that it's stably inherited um, throughout generations is one, another point to that. Um, it's gonna have to be done, but also uh, making sure that it only affects the rash borer, which is going to be extremely difficult to actually um, to actually work through and determine a good mechanism for that. So it's a, like I said, it's a it's a long and challenging road. So with that, um, 
I will say thank you for, again, for the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, I will be happy to take any questions or comments anyone has. Um, and yeah, any, any comments or questions? We have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, Joellen asks, uh, Emerald ash borer came from Asia. Is it killing ash trees in Asia? Is there some natural control of this borer in Asia? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, typically what we find is that when a pest is introduced here and it's a pest here, it's going to be a pest there, but it's a native pest there. So, it has restrictive factors such as, you know, natural predators. Um, natural predators would be one of those things. And that's the reason, you know, with biocontrol, we find those parasitoids, we find those natural predators, and we test them and make sure they're safe to introduce. And then, of course, we would introduce them that way. As far as resistance in ash, we do find that the, you know, I think a good example with that is um, with American chestnut and Chinese chestnut. So Chinese chestnut being resistant to the chestnut blight fungus. What they found is that the genes for resistance, for example, are spread out across the genome. So it's not like we can just, you know, uh, breed a single gene into American chestnut and expect it to hold some level of resistance and that be enough. And odds are it's the same with any resistance to something like Kimberly ash borer. Um, breeding it into or identifying those, um, those important genes for resistance, first of all, but also breeding it into our tree species is going to depend on whether or not they can be hybridized is one thing, uh, whether or not they're compatible for hybridization, but also uh, whether or not we can actually get all the genes necessary for that resistance into a hybrid. Um, so it can, be, it can be pretty complicated, but yeah. Okay, next question. Are there any, are any of the pesticides less harmful to beneficial insects? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, metacloprid is not one we like to put on, on the landscape and um, metacloprid can have effect on pollinators and such. And so what, what they typically say is that one way of working around that um, is to, especially with something like a metacloprid, is to apply it after the trees flower. So say that a metacloprid is available to your or tephron or something, and they only provide one year of protection. Um, if you were to treat the tree, you know, you have your, you have, um, you do it after the tree flowers, and then by the time the next year, any, any of the insecticide that might be in the pollen would be very negligible and hopefully not have an effect on the population. But I'm less, I'm less familiar with um, MMF than benzoate and its effect on other ones. I know that's not, it's obviously not specific to, um, to um, uh, emerald ash borer. It can affect other insects that maybe feed on the tree. Its incorporation into pollen though, I'm not entirely sure on, but I, um, that, that, yeah, definitely consideration to have. And so if you are worried about that, choosing one of the methods that is uh, annual treatment is probably the way to go. Um, and in that way, you can kind of protect your beneficial insects, especially pollinators that might be interacting with ash. Great, thank you. I think the next question from Anne, I think you just answered. Anne, if, if you are referring to something else, please let me know. But there's one other question. What other native trees are attractive to EAB? There's a reference online to white fringe tree as an EAB host. Yeah, so white fringe tree has been shown to be um, susceptible to infestation by EAB. Um, aside from that though, I don't, I don't know any others. I'm pretty sure it's white fringe tree and then of course your all of your ash species, but um, yeah, that is another one that can be affected. Okay, and that's all the questions we have for now. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Neil, would you like to wrap us up? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And I, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Stauder for an excellent presentation. I learned a lot and I know everybody else did. Uh, we're on the verge of the uh, adults, I believe, emerging from ash trees in a, within the next month. So I think you've helped us be better prepared. Uh, I will say one quick comment. Uh, it seemed like education was a big message uh, in your presentation. And I know in communities, uh, there's going to be a large fear factor when they hear about the EAB and they want to know if they have an ash tree. So it's very important they know how to identify an ash tree. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so, so they don't pay for a, a job that is on another species. But anyway, 
great job and I really appreciate it. And, uh, and just uh, in closing, a, a little bit about next month's presentation. Uh, one of your associates, uh, Cameron, uh, Diane Warwick, is going to be talking about the TAPE program. And awesome. uh, the, the state of Tennessee is going to be opening up applications for tree planting grants to communities. So uh, you definitely want to take, you know, schedule and plan to attend that uh, webinar next month. And Christy, I believe that's also on the third Thursday. I don't have the date in front of me, but that'll be the third Thursday in April. Uh, Diane will talk about the TAPE program and how to submit an application. There you go, April 15th. Uh, thank you again, uh, everybody, for attending, and y'all have a great afternoon.